Hi, I'm David Taub, and welcome to the Parsha Rabbit Hole, where I find something weird in the weekly Torah portion and follow it all the way down until it gets even weirder. This week's rabbit hole eventually gets us to a kosher alternative to pork and a wagon pulled by a fish. Fishy, fishy, fishy! But, as always, we have to get there. But first, we've got three dedications this week. When it rains, it pours. Which, by the way, is about salt and not about rain. First, last week's episode should have been dedicated to one of my dedicated listeners, Mendel Wax. So, I retroactively dedicate the Sailor episode to you, Mendel. This week's rabbit hole is dedicated by Hilula Status in honor of Reb Elimelech of Lezhensk, author of the Sefer Noyem Elimelech, and the leader in the dissemination of Hasidus in Poland and Galicia, whose yurtzeit was on the 21st of Adar. By the way, Hilula Status, which sponsored this dedication, is a very cool WhatsApp account that posts the sites of Tzadikim every day. So the link is in the description, and you can check that out if that's the sort of thing you're into. And finally, this week's rabbit hole is also sponsored by an appreciative fan in honor of number five. The person who sent this dedication in added rather cryptically, if you know, you know. Well, appreciative fan, I don't know. I tried to figure it out, and I couldn't. I thought maybe it might have something to do with the Rebbe Roshab, the fifth Rebbe of Chabad. Maybe that's number five? But his yard site is next week, and his birthday's in the fall, so the dates don't match up. Then I tried to figure out if there's maybe a connection to the fifth episode of the Parsha Rabbit Hole, which was about Groundhog Day. And I thought maybe because spring is starting, it has something to do with that. But the dates don't match up for that either, even if the Groundhog didn't see its shadow. So, either it's some sort of inside reference that only this person's friends or family is going to get, or I've just been stumped. If any of you guys can figure it out, let me know in the comments. And by the way, I really like the idea of putting puzzles and riddles in the dedications. I think that could be a lot of fun for everybody. If you'd like to dedicate an upcoming rabbit hole or make a small donation to help me keep on digging, go to creativejudaism.com slash donate. Okay, let's get started. In this week's Torah portion, Parsha's Shmini, besides for more sacrifice stuff, we learn the laws of kosher and non-kosher animals. Among those laws is quite possibly the most universally known thing about Jews, besides for anti-Semitic tropes, which is that we don't eat pigs. I don't even know what a kosher meal is. Uh, I think it means when a rabbi has inspected it or something. <laughs> no, no, it all has to do with the way they kill the pig. Now, come on, but they don't eat pigs. But... There's a fascinating teaching in the Talmud about how God gave us kosher alternatives to everything that's prohibited. Before I tell it to you, I just want to point out that while the vast majority of teachings in the Talmud were said by men, this one was taught by a woman, Yalta, who's mentioned several times in the Talmud as a very learned person. Okay, so this is what it says in the Gemara. Yalta said to her husband, Rav Nachman, that for everything that God prohibited to us, there's something similar which is permitted. The first example she gives is that we're not allowed to consume the blood of an animal, but we are allowed to eat liver, which I guess tastes like blood? I wouldn't know, because um, I've just never really been into brown animal goop in a deli container. It's just not something that's tempted me. Anyways, she gives a whole long list of other examples and then eventually gets to pig, and she says that the kosher version of that is the brain of a fish called shibuta. Now, the whole point of this teaching, by the way, was that she wanted to taste the kosher version of meat and milk. So her husband cooked a cow udder for her. Yum. But, as fascinating as the topic of udders in halacha is, that's not why I shared this Gemara with you. The reason why I shared it with you is because it introduces us to the shibuta, a fish whose brain tastes like bacon. Kosher? Kosher. Which is cool. But... That's just the tip of the Shibuta iceberg. The Shibuta comes up in a bunch of other contexts, and they're all weird. So that's where this week's rabbit hole starts, with the Shibuta. So if you're ready to find out more about this weird fish, let's dive in. Okay, so there are so many cool things to share about this fish that I wasn't even going to bother spending any time on the identity of the fish. Which fish is it? Hey, what's this one here? What's his name, Bert? But my wife said that I had to, so I will. But not yet. Because some of the ways in which this fish is mentioned in different places suggest different possibilities for its identity. So once we've heard a bunch of weird stuff about this fish, then I'll do a little roundup about what they suggest about the identity of the fish. Okay, so let's start with another Gemara. There are a lot of mitzvahs that deal with not mixing things. And one of those mitzvahs is that you're not allowed to use two different types of animals working together to perform one task. The Gemara we're about to look at is trying to figure out the parameters of this prohibition. And this is what it says. 
It asks, if a person drives a wagon with a goat and a shibuta fish, is that a problem? Now, okay, what does that mean exactly? It's kind of hard to imagine. How exactly does one have a goat and a fish pull a wagon? Fortunately for us, Meiri gives us all the details and paints a very clear picture for us. He says that the wagon is riding along the seashore, the goat is on dry land, and the fish is in the water, and they're both attached to the same rope such that the wagon is being pulled by both of them. So that's very cool. Not only does the Shibuta have bacon brains, it's also apparently strong enough to pull a wagon? Okay, next thing. But first some background. The Gemara mentions in a couple of places a very interesting law of nature, which is that every animal that exists on land has an aquatic version in the sea, with one exception, which is the weasel. So we're gonna ignore that very tempting weasel bait because we've got a lot of fish stuff to find and we gotta stay focused. We gotta have blinders on like a fish pulling a wagon. So in a different Gemara, it mentions some examples of these sea versions of animals. For example, a sea ox and a sea donkey. But Toysus adds that there are other sea somethings that aren't mentioned in that Gemara, and the example that they give is the Shibuta, which according to Toysus is the sea goat. And the proof that they give for that, that the Shibuta is the sea goat, is our Gemara about the wagon being pulled by the goat and the Shibuta. So this is interesting to me for a couple of reasons. First of all, it suggests that the question in that Gemara might be a lot more complicated than we originally thought. According to this, it could be asking if an animal and its aquatic counterpart are considered the same thing, enough at least, that it wouldn't be a problem to perform labor with both of them together, even though they're different species. Which is definitely not the normal way to learn that Gemara, which of course is why I'm drawn to it. See, whenever an issue requires any real thought, any serious mental effort, people turn to UFOs and sea serpents and Sasquatch. The next thing that's exciting about the idea of the Shibuta being the goat of the sea is that it creates an interesting animal triangle for me. We already learned that the Shibuta is connected to pigs through brain taste, and now we've got a way that the Shibuta is connected to goats, because it's the sea goat. And that pig Shibuta goat triangle does get addressed somewhere, but we'll look at that later on. For now, the most exciting part of this sea goat revelation is that it gets us to another weird fish story in yet another Gemara. Rav Safra said that he was once traveling on a ship, and they saw a certain fish that popped its head up out of the water, and it had horns. And carved on the horns were words that read, I am a lowly creature of the sea, and I am 300 parsings long. Which, by the way, is about 750 miles long. Okay, and then the engraving continues and reads, And I am going into the mouth of the Leviathan, which is a giant sea creature which I'm sure we'll get to in a future rabbit hole. Good day, Captain. Then at the end of this little piece, Rav Ashi adds that this is the goat of the sea, which combs the sea and has horns. Okay, so very cool fish story about a 750 mile long fish with horns and a death wish. But if we mash this together with the sea goat thing from Tysus, we might have a pretty awesome possible description of the Shibuta. And it definitely seems like a 750 mile long sea goat could pull a wagon but probably straight into the mouth of an even bigger sea monster. Okay, so that last one was a speculative connection that relied on a few moving parts. But now we'll continue with weird stuff that directly mentions the Shibuta. Let's look at another Gemara. The Sage of Baye gives a rather cryptic list of things that can cause leprosy. Animal hide, a cup, hot water, eggs, and white lice. The Gemara then explains each of those things, and I'm not going to get into all of them, but for example, hide means somebody who sleeps on raw animal hide that hasn't been processed or cleaned. And hot water means someone who pours boiling hot water on themselves. So most of them make sense to me, at least, as things that might reasonably cause skin infections. But the fish, the Gemara explains, is the Shibuta fish, specifically in the month of Nisan which is a Hebrew month in the spring, it's coming right up, and that's the month that Pesach is in. So this is a weird little Shibuta fun fact, and honestly, I don't completely understand it. I don't know if it means touching or eating. If you touch the fish in the month of Nisan, then it'll give the person leprosy, or maybe it means only if they eat the fish in the month of Nisan, then it will give them leprosy. I couldn't find any sources that clarified that, but either way, it's weird that that only happens in that particular month of Nisan. If anybody has any ideas why eating or touching this fish in the month of Nissan might be a leprosy hazard, let us know in the comments. Okay, moving on. 
This next thing isn't the weirdest thing about the Shibuta, but I think it's my favorite. The same exact thing actually shows up in two different places, and maybe kind of three, and we'll see why in a minute. But the two places that it's identical is Medrash Rabbah and Talmud Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud. It's talking about the first exile of the Jewish people, when the first base of Migdash, the first temple in Jerusalem, was destroyed, and the Jews went into exile in Babylonia. It says, 700 kinds of kosher fish and 800 kinds of kosher grasshoppers went into exile with the Jews into Babylonia. We're brothers, genius! We're in the human world! And when the Jews returned to Israel, all of these fish and grasshoppers returned with them. Except for one, the Shibuta. So this is interesting to me because it ties the fate of these fish to the fate of the Jewish people, and I think that's cool. But it also means that the Shibuta actually has it worse than the Jews. At least we got to go back for a while. The Shibuta didn't. And I wonder if it will get to come back with us in the time of Mashiach. And now I will throw the fish into the air. It will sail away and then it will come back to me. By the way, if I had said Messianic Era instead of the time of Mashiach, it probably would have gotten me some extra clicks, but I have too much integrity to do that. Okay, so you might be wondering why the Shibuta didn't get to come back to the land of Israel with us. I know I was. Yefem Mare, a commentary on the story parts of the Talmud Yerushalmi, offers one possible answer. He says that it's because their brains taste like pig, and because of that, it isn't fitting for them to be in Israel. Which I think is a cool answer, but also, what about actual pigs? There are pigs in Israel, so why are actual pigs allowed to be there, but the kosher fish whose brains only taste like pig aren't? So that's a mystery. But that's not the only answer given for why the Shibutza didn't follow the Jews back to Israel. There's a slightly similar story in the Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, which is the one that we're usually talking about. But in the Bavli's version, the fish has a different name. This is what I meant before when I said that there might be a third place that has the same story. So it's almost the same, but you'll see how it's a little bit different. It says that all the animals returned except for the Kolyas HaIspinin. And then it explains that all the fish swam back through underground aquifers. But the Kolyas couldn't because its spine isn't strong enough to swim upstream. So based on the fact that pretty much the same exact story is told about the Shibuta in the Talmud Yerushalmi and in Midrash, many commentaries say that the story in the Talmud Bavli about the Kolyas HaIspinin is the same story and that they're the same fish. Which would mean that instead of having to say that the Shibuta is in permanent exile because it has bacon brains, we can say that the Shibuta is in permanent exile because the poor little guys just couldn't make the swim, even though apparently they can pull a wagon. Well, my weaknesses are actually strengths. Okay, so now that we have some conflicting physical elements and two different names so far, I think it's time to get into the possible identity of the fish. The most obvious option is the Shabut which is a freshwater carp found in Western Asia and in the rivers of Iran. So that lines up with them being exiled to Babylonia, and of course the name is the same. But Wikipedia doesn't like that name connection, and warns us very clearly not to rely on the name similarity, and even uses the Talmud against us to stop us from doing so. But that's okay, because there are several other options available to us. What about that name, Kolyas HaIspinin? Turns out that Kolyas is a Greek word, but it also became a Latin word. And that word Kolyas in Latin is part of the scientific name of the Atlantic chub mackerel. But what about the Ispinin part? Kolyas ha Ispinin. According to Sefer Ha'aruch, which is a super cool medieval encyclopedia of Talmudic terminology, it refers to Spain, which would make it the Spanish Kolyas. Which at first glance doesn't tell us much. There's no geographic clues that we have that would point to Spain and that would help us figure out what this fish is. But the Arabic word shibuta, which comes from our shibuta in Aramaic, has an etymological descendant in Spanish, which is chaputa, which according to Google can translate to two different fish. One is the pomfret and the other is the gobi. Okay, so so far, we've got a few possibilities. We've got a carp, a mackerel, a pomfret, and a gobi. But just to top it all off, Rashi translates Kolyas HaIspinin as tuna, which would make a lot of sense because, as we all know, tuna is very famously referred to as the goat of the sea. If all of these possibilities make your head spin, don't worry. The Kafa Chaim acknowledges the various conflicting physical descriptions of this fish and concluded that there must be multiple types of Shibuta, which I think means several completely different species of fish which all happen to be called by the same name. 
Three fish, four fish, five fish. So that's one way of dealing with all these random things about this fish that don't seem to fit together. But the Ruggachever going has a commentary that pulls a lot of these different Shibuta pieces together in a way that I thought was really cool. He's explaining the story in Beratius, where Yaakov goes to intercept the birthright of his brother Esav. So their father Yitzchak asks Esav to go make him some tasty meat. Esav was a hunter, and so Yitzchak asked him to go hunt some meat and bring it to him. Yitzchak's wife and Yaakov and Esav's mother Rivka overhears this conversation, and she tells Yaakov to go get two goats and she'll cook them into a tasty dish, and then he'll go instead of his brother Esav. So the question is, why goats? Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the work of the Ragachevar Gain, his style is that he presents radical new ideas in the form of a chain of sources, with little to no explanation bridging any of it together. So it can be very challenging to understand, and I actually spent a few days trying to figure this one out. So I never translate sources word for word here, but I do usually try to keep it close enough that you can follow along with the on-screen text if you want to. But I'm not even going to try to do that here. I'll put the Hebrew up on screen for a little while for those that want to fact check me, or you can find it in the source sheet if you want. But I'm just going to do my best to explain it in my own words. The Rokhet Shavagoyin has a recurring theme in his commentary on this part of Beratius that Esav has some sort of spiritual and halachic connection to a pig. So what he says here is that Yitzchak was trying to fix Esav. He loved Esav and he wanted him to reach the potential that he could see in him. So to do that, he used that pig shibuta goat triangle that we talked about earlier. Yitzchak wanted to take Esav, who's like a pig, and turn him into a goat, which is kosher. And the reason why that would work, why that would be possible, is because both of them already have a connection via the Shibuta, which has a bacon brain, but it's the goat of the sea. The explanation is simple. It's all connected. But there's a problem. The Shibuta never left the Babylonian exile. It didn't come back to the land of Israel with the Jews. Why? Because it doesn't fit with Geula, freedom. How do we know that? Because it causes leprosy during Nisan, which is the month of Geula, the month of freedom. Because that's when Passover is, in which we celebrate our freedom from slavery in Egypt. So Esau can't get pulled over to the good side through the goat meat because the connecting point, the Shibuta, is antithetical to freedom. That's how it is in the meat model. But in real life, what does that translate to? Esav has a deep connection with the Jewish people. His descendants and Yaakov's descendants, which is us, have been intertwined throughout history. But then his descendants, the Romans, destroyed the second base of Migdash, the second temple, and created the diaspora that we're in right now. Which means that his connection to us, that connecting point, is fundamentally messed up and can't be used as a bridge. Okay, so why is this meaningful to me? Honestly, I don't know, mainly just because I like how it brings all these random Shibuta facts together. But I also thought about this a little bit to see if I could come up with some way to apply it. And here's what I came up with, which is that you can't work with somebody if the only common ground you have between one another is the pain that one of them has caused the other. You've got to find a better starting point than bacon brains. All right, that's it, that's the rabbit hole. As always, if you have any questions or insights or something that I missed, put it in the comments. Thank you for following me down the rabbit hole, which this week I think might have been dug by a sea rabbit.